Sir Julian Hunt. I'm absolutely delighted to see uh, so many of you uh, here. Uh, this talk is very much uh, the brainchild of uh, Michael Kellyan. Um, it's entitled uh, Jerusalem and uh, Misconceptions. And I'm really, really excited to have uh, talking to us uh, Natasha Hausdorff. Uh, Natasha Hausdorff is a barrister at Six Pump Court Chambers. Uh, she serves as the legal director for Israel, for UK Lawyers for Israel Charitable Trust, and she sits on the committee of the UK Association of Jewish Lawyers and Jurists. She was a fellow in the National Security Law Programme at Columbia Law School in New York and clerked for the President of the Israeli Supreme Court in Jerusalem, Chief Justice Miriam Naor. Natasha has a law degree from Oxford University and an LLM uh, in international law from uh, Tel Aviv University, where she focused on public international law and the law of armed conflict. She originally qualified as a solicitor at the commercial law firm, the, white, the American White Shoe Firm, uh, Skadden Arps. She then worked for them in London and Brussels, and uh, she speaks frequently on international uh, affairs, foreign affairs, and national uh, security policy. It's quite an incredible uh, CV for someone as uh, young as her, compared to a South London hack like myself in particular. <laughs> Uh, we're going to talk for about 15 and 20 minutes, Natasha and myself, and then we will open it up to questions from you all. So I know you're all going to be absolutely eager, keen to ask questions. If during uh, the talk between Natasha and I on Jerusalem misconceptions, you want to butt in or join in, then feel free to use the chat function uh, at, the, at the bottom of the screen. Luckily, it won't be used for updating us on penalty scores in the England match. It would have been my, uh, my, my, uh, my, my nightmare. So, um, Natasha, um, Jerusalem and misconceptions. Um, the first thing, please, I would like to ask you is um, about uh, Sheikh Jarrah. I'm presuming I'm pronouncing incorrectly. But if you could please explain to me the significance of that particular dispute over what appears to me to be a number of properties, there are evictions uh, going through, and, and what are the misconceptions over that, and how that became such a huge, huge issue, please, and especially in May of this year, uh, please. Julian, I'd be absolutely delighted. Um, I wonder if I may cheekily take a, a, a small prerogative um, and perhaps do what may be quite a substantial introduction before yeah. we get into the specific instance of, of Sheikh Jarrah, which has, of course has been uh, through the headlines all of, um, well, two months ago now, um, more or less, uh, and has uh, remained in the headlines. I think there were just articles earlier this week um, and indeed earlier today on the, uh, the situation there. Um, but first of all, thank you so much for the introduction. And I have been honoured um, to be involved with UK Lawyers for Israel. Uh, for uh, quite a substantial amount of time, and that is, of course, how I, I got to know you, Julian. Um, one of the many areas um, that UKLFI contends with uh, is the misrepresentation of international law vis-a-vis -vis Israel, and we see that uh, accusations that Israel violates international law are, are thrown around, really, without basis or justification. But the difficulty uh, is that, of course, international law can be quite complex uh, and it can be very easily misrepresented, and it is misrepresented in relation to Israel. It is an area uh, in which law and politics often overlap, um, but more than anything, I think we have seen a, a special language of condemnation uh, which has developed in relation to illegal settlements, uh, inextricably linked with illegal occupation, uh, which are unique in terms of their use with respect to Israel. And contrary to the manner in which uh, international law is applied elsewhere. Um, so what I would propose to do, and I appreciate it might be a, a, a particularly long preamble, but I think it's crucial, yeah. um, is to talk about what international law can tell us about the legal status of the territory. And within that context, um, look at Jerusalem. And also, I think, uh, importantly, the, the settlements issue. Uh, because these are all intimately connected in the way that the international law is um, misapplied or even abused. 
Um, so international law is very different to domestic law. Uh, it's a body of rules that are recognized by nations as binding them uh, in their relations with one another. And there are two important sources um, to be mindful of in the context of, of our discussion. Treaty law, uh, that can be written agreements uh, between states bilaterally or multilaterally, uh, and it's like a contract. A multilateral treaty is often referred to as a, a convention. Uh, and this is law that states have signed themselves up to and bound themselves by. The other key source to note for our purpose this evening is custom. Now, international customary law develops over time, and it is said to develop out of a general practice, which is accepted by law, uh, accepted as law, I should say. So what that means is that if a sufficient number of states behave in a certain way, believing themselves to be bound to behave in that way legally, at some point, that issue, that point crystallizes into customary international law. Uh, the behavior generates the customary rule of international law, which then binds all states. Now, there's a big misconception, um, which I think needs to be addressed briefly, and that is in relation to UN resolutions. UN resolutions very rarely have legal effect. They're generally not a source of law. These are political as opposed to legal instruments. Generally speaking, only Security Council resolutions that have been made explicitly under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, and this is very few resolutions indeed, only those are legally binding. And the reason they're rare is because it, I think it makes sense, it's a lot easier to pass a, a political resolution, a resolution without legal teeth. Um, examples of that include uh, Resolution 678 in 1990 with respect to Iraq, that's where the Security Council gave Iraq a set period to withdraw from Kuwait, and it empowered states to use all necessary means to force Iraq out of Kuwait after the deadline. Uh, and another famous example is Security Council Resolution 1373, um, which was in response to the 9-11 attacks, uh, was also famously made under that Chapter 7 rubric, um, but they are very rare. With that, let's come to the status of the territory. Um, and this fundamental rule of customary international law that establishes the borders of newly emerging states at independence, as in Israel's case in 1948. This is a rule of custom that is universally applied. It uh, developed in the 19th century. It was applied in South America. It was later applied in Africa and Asia, and still later at the disintegration of the former communist federations. And it's been applied to all the states that emerged in these cases. It's also been applied to states emerging from former mandates. The universal rule for determining the borders of newly emerging states at the moment of independence dictates that the new state takes on the boundaries of the pre-existing administrative unit as its international borders. Now we'll look at what that means, but the rule is called uti possidetis juris. I promise it's the only bit of Latin um, that I'll be using. It's the default rule. So anywhere there is no agreement to the contrary, this rule is universally applied as a matter of customary international law to provide uh, certainty, to avoid frontiers being challenged uh, and to avoid wars breaking out to promote uh, peace and stability. Those were the reasons the International Court of Justice recognized as being behind the development of this fundamental rule. Now, another fundamental rule of international law is its equal application. You cannot have a general rule and an exception for a country you just don't like very much or you have some uh, political or ideological opposition to, that is not how any respectable legal system can operate. So the question is, what does this rule universally apply tell us about the legal status of the territory in Israel's case? Well, in 1948, the administrative lines of the eastern side of the British Mandate ran along the Jordan River all the way to the south, originally dividing it from the separate administrative unit of Transjordan, which became the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And by the way, Jordan's borders also followed the rule of Uti Possidetis Juris. And if it's helpful, um, maybe in terms of the questions, we can share some maps to illustrate this. But the key issue is that Israel 
as the only state to emerge from that mandate territory in 1948, automatically assumes as its international borders the administrative lines of the mandate, and that includes East Jerusalem and the West Bank, which was occupied by Jordan in the 1948-1949 independence war, that Israel's independence war. Those same areas were recovered by Israel in 1967. Uh, and this is crucial as we'll come to see is to, to the issue of Jerusalem, because the legal status um, of the whole of that territory applying this rule, which is universally applied, and there is no convincing reason here not to apply it. The effect of that rule uh, is that it dictates that Israel was the sovereign there in 1948. Now, there's been no agreement of any kind on the transfer of sovereignty since 1948, uh, but there can be unilateral actions taking by Israel uh, in relation to relinquishing sovereignty over parts of the territory. Uh, and there is an argument to say that Israel's done just that with the unilateral withdrawal from Gaza. And we'll come on to what Israel did in relation to, um, to the West Bank and, and, uh, and Eastern Jerusalem. But the starting point is crucial because it tells us that Israel's presence in the territory is entirely lawful. And crucially, it is not a situation of occupation, uh, which, I suggest is another misrepresentation. Um, this is, a, I think, a brief but important aside. The framework of the law of occupation developed in public international law, not to protect the rights of ordinary people, but to protect the rights of a former sovereign during a period in which they were ousted from their territory. So even if one were to quibble with uh, customary international law and reject the application of uti possidetis juris, uh, to say that the universal rules um, under international law for some reason do not apply to Israel. There is no other sovereign that has been ousted from their territory which would trigger the proper application of a situation of occupation. The occupation framework in which, uh, crucially, the Geneva Conventions are applied does not work where there is no sovereign uh, from which Israel acquired the land. I've explained Jordan, which controlled the territory before 67, uh, was not a legitimate sovereign. If anything, it was occupying that land between 1948 and 1967 from Israel. Uh, and of course, uh, it did not comply with international law in that it ethnically cleansed Eastern Jerusalem and the West Bank of all of its Jews. Uh, and the occupation framework also does not apply after a peace agreement, uh, such as the peace agreement between Israel and Jordan. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, again, another crucial aspect um, that is universal, but for some reason overlooked when it comes to Israel. And um, so that's the general picture on territory. Uh, and now to pick up on the issue of Jerusalem and, and to answer the question really, what did Israel do with its uh, rights, legal rights um, with respect to Jerusalem? And here it's important to um, realize Israel's declaration of independence does not contain any uh, reference to Jerusalem. It does not specifically mention borders at all. Uh, in 1949, the Knesset decided that Jerusalem would be the capital of Israel. And on the 26th of December 1949, the Knesset held its first session in West Jerusalem. In 1950, the Israeli parliament again declared Jerusalem to be the capital of the state of Israel. And when Israeli forces ousted Jordanian forces from East Jerusalem and the West Bank uh, in the Six Day War, ending on the 10th of June 1967, Israel immediately took steps to extend its law, administration and jurisdiction over the whole of Jerusalem uh, using the terminology areas formerly part of mandatory Palestine. Uh, and that's key. It's also wording that is mirrored in the ceasefire agreements and indeed peace agreements uh, that later came to be between Israel and Egypt and Israel and Jordan. All of that is taking us back to the crucial importance of uti possidetis juris, uh, because it's the mandatory boundaries, the administrative lines that are always being uh, referred back to. Um, and so uh, Israel, the Is Israeli Knesset, passed the law and administration ordinance um, in, uh, in 1967 uh, in order to affect this. Uh, and also crucially worth noting um, is that in 1967 in July, then Minister of Foreign Affairs Abba Eben informed the UN Secretary General in writing that its acts did not constitute annexation. Um, and that uh, I think is particularly pertinent in the context of the debate that was occurring last year 
um, with, uh, I would suggest that, that the wrong use of that term, but we can certainly come on to that if we've got time. Um, the Israeli Supreme Court has considered the legal status of Jerusalem in um, pretty uh, crucially in a 1993 case uh, called the Tem Temple Mount Faithful Association and the Attorney General. Uh, and this related in particular to uh, the Temple Mount. And the court confirmed that the Temple Mount is part of uh, the territory of the state of Israel, even though, of course, Israel has given the Jordanian wax authority over that site. Uh, it held that the laws of Israel apply to um, uh, the Temple Mount and, and Jerusalem uh, in full. And those are laws uh, that it referenced guaranteeing freedom of worship, uh, right um, of access and protection uh, against desecration with respect to the holy places. Now, in relation to the West Bank, um, we have a different story. Israel did not apply uh, its law administration and jurisdiction in the same way that it did in Jerusalem. Instead, it established a temporary administration, uh, ad anticipating, uh, I think, that as part of a peace negotiation with Jordan, territory may well change hands. But of course, that temporary administration uh, has lasted uh, over half a century. Um, Julian, you didn't ask specifically about settlements, but I think we've come so far. I, I might just say a few words um, on them. Before you do, I want to ask yeah. about the, the term settlements. Is, is, the, is the word settlements, the term settlers, is, is that recognised as a, as, as, a, as a phrase or a term in, in international, international law? No, no, and it's not used elsewhere, really. Certainly not with a, in a it has no legal meaning. Um, and certainly the notion of, a, of an illegal settler um, is also devoid of, of legal meaning. Uh, and I think if we come on to look at a couple of examples um, of how, I don't want to say similar situations, but I'd say situations of real occupation, yeah. uh, real transfer situations are viewed uh, around the world, that contrast will come into really stark light. Mm -hmm. um, it is a political term, uh, not a legal one. I think that's the probably the yeah. best way of explaining it. Um, but the, I think the first thing we have to acknowledge when we're looking at the question of settlements is, is the absence of an international consensus on a legal framework which properly addresses the territory. Um, and that, that feeds in, of course, to, to the terminology that is used. So um, uh, what I think is, is best to do is, is look at the legal mechanism which forms the basis of criticism of Israeli settlements, uh, and that has been on the basis of the Geneva Convention, specifically Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention. Now, now bear with me here. It is actually, I think, um, quite straightforward if we, if we break down that article. Um, Before you go, I just want to, um, there's a, a, something from the chat. This is from uh, Morris Solovitz. Uh, it says this, um, the issue is that the Hebrew is translated by Israel's settlements mm -hmm. and Israel has never come to terms with the negative propaganda value of, of the term. Is there something you would like to say about, about that particular comment uh, at all? Well, the, um, the way that the Hebrew term is translated into English, uh, I, I agree with the questioner, is, is probably the key of the problem here. It, in Israel, that you don't have a notion of a, of a settler. These are simply villagers. Um, and you can have villages of this type all throughout Israel. There is no specific word which has been developed to um, differentiate those that happen to be positioned in the West Bank as opposed to uh, anywhere else in the country. I mean, Israel is a country of settlements. And of course, that is what the pioneers did even before uh, the state was established. Uh, that was, in fact, how the country was built. Um, but the reason, so the, the term settler, doesn't really have any basis, um, as, as we discussed in, in international law. It really has, though, taken off um, as part of the political terminology, and it feeds in, of course, to the other uh, political terminology that is used with respect to Israel. I, I see it as bearing a great deal of similarity to uh, apartheid, to um, settler colonialism. All of that language has been developed um, principally in order to pursue uh, the agenda against Israel. Um, but in particular, uh, Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, in which the word settler doesn't appear, uh, is what has been uh, underpinning the international discourse um, on uh, Israeli settlements. Um, that article provides that the occupying power shall not deport or transfer 
parts of its own civilian population in the territory that it occupies. Um, that's the phraseology of, of the relevant section. You can see Settler doesn't appear there at all, but it's on that basis that settlement policy has been criticized as a breach of international law by um, the International Court of Justice, uh, the Security Council, the International Committee for the Red Cross and, and various uh, countries and international commentators. Now, there are two substantial errors with this criticism. And the first is the applicability of the provisions of the Geneva Convention uh, to the West Bank. Um, I explained that the Geneva Convention applies to situations of occupation. And I've already addressed why that label for the disputed territory is not legally appropriate. But the second error relates to the mischief which Article 49.6, which was the one I just read out, um, was designed to counter. Uh, indeed, the context of that article um, is that it was drafted after the, uh, well, in the aftermath of World War II and the forced transfer of populations by the Nazi regime. In fact, the full text of Article 49 prohibits mass, uh, individual or mass, forcible transfers. So the article was directed against the heinous practice of the Nazi regime during its occupation of Europe of forcibly transporting populations of which it wished to rid itself into or out of um, occupied territories. Uh, and in the case of the Jews, this was the case for the purpose of killing them uh, or to provide slave labor. So it's clear to me that the whole article is concerned with that forced transfer of populations against their will. And the last paragraph that I read out, um, paragraph six, which uh, relates to an occupier's own civilian population, uh, it strikes me as also logically connected to that theme of forced transfer. And I think that's also um, apparent from the preparatory materials. So when the convention was being drafted, the discussions uh, that are referred to in the uh, Travaux Preparatoire indicate that these uh, amendments were proposed and debated um, in the context of those transfers of populations against their will. So the application of uh, these provisions to Israeli settlements remains problematic as the settlement movement uh, concerns individuals and collectives moving voluntarily to the area after 1967. The provision against transfer cannot objectively be uh, construed to cover the voluntary movement of individuals, not as a result of state transfer, but of their own volition um, and as an expression of their personal choice. So the restriction on transfer we've seen is, is uh, a restriction on government action. It's not a requirement that the government stop civilian movement into an area, although I should say that the Israeli government has on occasion done exactly this, where it had a legal basis on which to remove uh, individuals settling on private land. Um, but the spontaneous or voluntary movement of Israeli nationals it simply doesn't trigger uh, the text of Article 49.6. And I think the proof uh, of the pudding um, is in how Israel is treated in relation to other states. And I, um, I, I mentioned um, the hope of coming on to this uh, earlier. So um, it's a subject that has been um, developed um, in a seminal piece of work by uh, Professor Eugene Kontorovich, um, who has done an analysis um, of settlement situations, settle real situations of settlement and, and real situations of uh, occupation around the world. Um, and this is um, revealed that the international community is, has consistently uh, acquiesced to government orchestrated settlement activity. Um, places like uh, a situation of real occupation, so unlike the West Bank, um, but one that actually uh, exists as contemplated by the Geneva Conventions, um, and uh, also where this government orchestrated settlement activity forms part of its policy. The, the normal hypocrisy and double standards, essentially. Right, um, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, to give uh, our audience a sense of the scale of this, I mean, uh, in East Timor, uh, in the context of the Indonesian occupation, uh, which involved a large scale settlement enterprise, uh, which explicitly aimed to change the demographic balance uh, in that occupied territory in Western Sahara, where Morocco's settlement program is one of the longest and largest and most ambitious uh, in northern Cyprus, where the ongoing Turkish occupation constitutes one of the most substantial settlement enterprises today. Uh, and it's particularly noticeable because it takes place within the territory of the European Union. Um, we also have the Syrian occupation of Lebanon, uh, 
where there were mass movements of civilians um, into occupied territory between 1982 and 1990. Uh, in Cambodia, several hundred thousand Vietnamese settlers came to Cambodia during a, a decade of occupation between 1978 and 1990. In Azerbaijan, uh, where the Nakoro Karabakh region has uh, historically had substantial um, Armenian majority or Armenia encouraged substantial immigration into the territory. Um, and of course, I'm sure situations that will be very familiar to our audience during uh, Russia's occupation uh, in Georgia, Abkhazia, but also in Ukraine, uh, in Crimea. And it's worthy of note that um, there have been uh, a centralized state sponsored program to settle people in the territory, the explicit purpose of which is to change demographics again. Now, in many of these cases, um, the actions have been accompanied by large scale human rights abuses. Um, and in some cases, um, there has been international attention on those human rights abuses. Uh, and the case of Crimea has involved the imposition of sanctions on Russia um, for many other violations of international law, but no country, no organization, no international human rights group has said anything about uh, Crimea settlers. What, what a surprise. Or, or even um, attempted uh, in any way to monitor the, the settlement activity. Now, I appreciate, Julian... Um, I'm, I'm, I'm itching to get the audience asking you questions, <laughs> Natasha, at this point in time. Um, I'm absolutely uh, sure uh, they have numerous questions to ask you. Um, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to ask the question that's come through on the chat mm -hmm. and I'm going to open it up to audience members. I suggest you unmute yourself, say who you are, and then please ask your question and Natasha can answer it. Please make it a question. Question start with what, who, when, how, not a lengthy statement if you can. Um, but let's just go to this question in the in the chat. Um, excuse me. Um, uh, if one accepts Miss Haustall's premise, does she think that Israel should encompass all the West Bank? What would she do about the uh, Palestinians? And I'll let you read the rest of the uh, question there. What do you um, uh, say about that? It's from Pamela uh, Mayakoros, please. Sure. Um, so crucially, the analysis of Utipositatis gives us the starting point and it debunks this myth um, that Israel is in the occupation or there is anything illegal um, uh, attached to Israel's actions. Um, but it doesn't say uh, what exactly the current state of affairs is, and it certainly doesn't dictate any solution for the future. Um, so I mentioned Israel's unilateral withdrawal from the Gaza Strip uh, in 2005. There is a strong argument to say that on that basis, Israel uh, unilaterally relinquished uh, sovereign claim to that territory. Um, and of course, uh, that is now ruled absolutely uh, by the, the terrorist regime Hamas. The situation in the West Bank is, is very much more complicated than that, because I mentioned the temporary administrative uh, framework that Israel established in 1967. Um, the peace, well, I, I say uh, advisedly peace agreements, but the interim agreements that Israel entered into with the Palestinian Authority, um, or those that created the Palestinian Authority, I should say, the Oslo Accords, were very clear uh, that they had no impact on sovereignty uh, and that that would be a, a matter for final uh, status negotiations. Um, but uh, the underlying situation uh, hasn't impacted in any way Israel's sovereign claim to the territory. Um, I certainly don't advocate for uh, the sort of um, uh, situation that the, Pamela was at the questioner was, was suggesting. I don't suggest that it, the, the underlying legal situation dictates the political decisions and agreements that Israel enters into with its neighbors. Um, uh, now, Richard Galber has asked a question. I know Richard Galber, he's no shrinking violet. He's a wonderful man. Richard, are you there? And can you unmute yourself? And maybe you want to ask your question, please. Or maybe he's disappeared. Richard Galber? I, can... like head, I feel like a headmaster. I'll ask the question instead then. Um, is there an, isn't there an element of difference between the wording of the Geneva Convention and the ICC Rome statutes to try and include a voluntary movement of civilians into occupied territories? Do you want to answer that question? Thanks, Natasha. There absolutely is. Um, and it's the reason that neither Israel nor, in fact, the United States signed on to the Rome Statute. Um, it was an indication from the very first moment that um, the too many states parties to the International Criminal Court intended it to be a political instrument 
as opposed to uh, an objective court. And that was the uh, insertion of the words direct or indirect um, into the uh, phraseology where um, the issue of transfer from Article 496 is, is addressed in the Rome Statute. Um, and that certainly does inform um, the position that the prosecutor, the previous prosecutor, Fatou Bensouda, took uh, in relation to her proposed investigation. Um, and it may yet inform the position that um, Kareem Khan, who is the uh, very recent um, uh, yeah. prosecutor that began recently, may take as well. Uh, but it is the only um, instance in which, uh, uh, well, it, it, it's telling, I think, particularly telling the context in which those words were uh, introduced. Does it um, affect the, the situation of the settlements um, in Israel? I don't think it does at all because of the underlying legal position. Uh, that, of course, isn't changed by the insertion of those words. Uh, and to properly understand where the drafting came from, we do need to look at the context in which um, the provision was originally drafted in the Geneva Conventions. Um, Richard, do you have a follow up for that at all? Or any more questions from the floor, please? Um, basically, just one thing. They're very unclear. I can hardly hear you. Um, is that better? Much, much more. I need much louder. I need it. Sorry, Richard. Hang on. Is that any better? Uh, shout it and we should be able to hear you. Okay. China has occupied Tibet and is almost committing a cultural genocide against the Tibetans. And nobody ever talks about it. It's never even, uh, it doesn't get discussed in the UN or any of the other international forums. That's so, it. Uh, well, you're, you're right that um, the focus internationally is consistently on Israel. Uh, and one actually only needs to look at the, the kind of resolutions that are passed by the Human Rights Council um, in Geneva uh, and the focus um, that is placed upon Israel uh, across the board, the fact that it is the only country to have uh, its standing agenda item uh, agenda item uh, seven that uh, that targets Israel. So it, what you're describing uh, is is not uncommon, and indeed um, Ju Julian has cynically been remarking on it throughout. Uh, any more questions from the floor at all? Anyone else? I'm conscious, Julian, that your your question on Sheikh Jarrah is one that I had. Um... I, I've got two questions, in fact, yeah. Natasha. Before I, before we discuss that one. Um, I would like to discuss with you the ICC judgment um, on, on jurisdiction over, over Israel. Um, what is your view um, on, 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 on that judgment? I know there's a very, very powerful dissent in that particular case. And do you think the election of, of Mr Khan as the new um, chief prosecutor at the ICC, an ex-CPS lawyer, I should add, um, uh, will make any difference um, at all, please? Well, I don't think anyone really knows uh, what Kareem Khan will do, um, although the, the fact that the prosecutor, the previous prosecutor, Ben Suda, began the investigation um, just before Khan's term was about to begin uh, may suggest that, that that is unlikely to have been done without consultation. Um, but in relation to uh, what you've described, this is a decision by Pretrial Chamber 1 on the question of jurisdiction that was raised by uh, Fatou Ben Souda. Uh, it is quite a light decision in comparison with a very heavy dissent. Yeah. It was the presiding judge, Judge Kovacs, uh, that uh, dissented and um, used language that is not often heard in court, I have to say, in terms of the um, lack of a legal basis uh, for the decision that was made to determine that there was, in fact, jurisdiction for the court to begin its mm -hmm. Now, that is not the last uh, word on this matter, um, and the majority in that decision were clear to say that the question of jurisdiction would, um, would have to be uh, dealt with at later stages in the process. So in a sense, they sort of dodged that part of the question. But what they did is, uh, is they gave the green light to the, the opening of the investigation without grappling, um, absolutely um, unbelievably, without grappling with uh, key legal questions, uh, such as whether Palestine might be um, properly in law uh, determined to be a state. Uh, it's clear, I think, that the reason that they didn't uh, engage in that level of analysis is that uh, a state of Palestine wouldn't meet the internationally recognised criteria for statehood under the Montevideo 
uh, convention. Um, the court also, the pretrial chamber also um, completely uh, refused to engage with the effect of the Oslo Accords, which were, of course, uh, what have established the Palestinian Authority uh, in the uh, West Bank, um, under which authority they have purported to sign up to uh, the Rome Statute. Uh, they present themselves as a state. Um, and the arguments associated with the Oslo Accords, which were made very powerfully by many friends of the court, uh, Amiki, uh, that submitted briefs to the pretrial chamber uh, in response to the prosecutor's request. I mean, all of that was just dismissed out of hand. Um, it's incredibly troubling. Uh, I've written on it to say that it is um, really uh, very dangerously uh, evidently turning the court into a political rather than a legal institution and of course that undermines the court's um, uh, validity uh, and its, uh, its ability to be taken seriously in the international community and Boris Johnson uh, wrote uh, in clear terms uh, on that the fact that the Prime Minister of, of the United Kingdom would come out to clearly call out this decision and the opening of an investigation is is um, a very significant indication, uh, along with, of course, the fact that uh, there were many states <laughs> to the Rome Statute that put in uh, amici submissions, submissions as friends of the court, to say um, these are all of the legal reasons why jurisdiction cannot possibly be found. Um, I'm going to ask you a question from the, the live chat. Um, uh, although the General Assembly cannot pass legally binding resolution of international issues, the UN Security Council has the authority to do so, has passed a total of six Security Council resolutions in Israel on the matter, including UN SC Resolution 478, which affirmed the enactment of the 1980 Basic Jerusalem Law, declaring unified Jerusalem as Israel's eternal indivisible capital, uh, was a violation of international law. Uh, the resolution advised member states to withdraw their diplomatic representation from the city. The Security Council, as well as the UN generals, consistently affirmed that the position that East Jerusalem, open brackets, but not West Jerusalem, close brackets, is occupied Palestinian territory. Do you think this is invalid, as this resolution was not under Chapter uh, Chapter 7? Um, I wouldn't say that they are invalid, but they have no legal effect. These are political statements. Um, now, there is a situation in which a resolution not made under Chapter 7 can be held to still have binding effect, um, and that is if it is made under Chapter 6, but it also contains language such as decides, um, something to indicate that it was intended to have a, a legal effect. Um, and I think well, certainly the resolutions that have been cited, but Security Council resolutions in, in respect of Israel generally uh, do not contain that language um, and are therefore not legally binding. And that's not just because it's only in extreme situations um, that the council will actually um, decide to pass a, a legally binding resolution as opposed to a political one. Um, but it's also because of the dynamics on the Security Council, um, of course, the, the US veto. Um, and while perhaps with the example of uh, Security Council Resolution um, 2334, uh, it was just at the tail end of the Obama administration. It was particularly controversial that the Americans sort of gave the green light for that to go through. Um, but I think that's much easier to understand when you recognize that these resolutions don't in fact have legal effect, they are political. There is an argument, um, and we've seen it used in respect to the International Criminal Court, that um, when you have a sufficient quantity of these resolutions, uh, they generate the sort of customary principle or customary rules that I explained in relation to Utipos Status Juris. Um, and uh, a number of parties, and in fact, the prosecutor of the ICC relied on that in her reasoning, and, and it was um, substantially adopted by the majority. The big problem with that approach um, is that this is not widespread practice. This is only in relation to Israel. These are exceptions that are made with respect to Israel. Um, and as I indicated right at the start, you cannot have a legal rule that uh, applies only to a state or in fact, you know, general legal principles that apply equally to every other state but you single one out for different treatment. Um, that's not appropriate. That's what these UN resolutions do. Uh, and that's why even if they are numerous in number, they're never going to get over the bar, um, in, in my um, 
opinion uh, to actually generate law because it's not general enough and it's not consistent enough and it's it's not right that it's just focusing on one. On. I think you may have answered the next the next question I'm going to ask you've got to, I'm going to do a batch of two now uh, one is from Brian Fink I'm going to go through that one first of all uh, how does the anti or UN security Resolution of 2016 from which the US abstained on Obama's instruction affect the legal position we all know that 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 that, that resolution and I'm going to in that batch put in this question from, from Sarah Samuels uh, why does this anti-Israel attitude um, encounters anti-semitism anti-semitism and you can go on to that if you want um, and I'm also going to go on to um, uh, Judy's question as well, uh, Wolominski's question. Um, three questions on the trot for you to have a look at. Um, Lib Dem Friends of Israel state, quote, it is discriminatory for right-wing Israeli separate organisations to use law to evict residents of Sheikh Jarrah when there is no equivalent uh, law for Arabs and, and, and Palestinians. How can we respond to, to this? Can you very briefly, I think, first of all, uh, uh, look at the um, question from Brian Fink about the 2016 infamous resolution, please, if possible, and then maybe go on to um, Judy Wellemensky's uh, concern, please. Sure. Um, you're, you're absolutely right. That I, that is what I addressed in terms of resolution 2334. Mm. Um, it, it doesn't have legal effect. Does it um, create a difficult political situation? Absolutely. Um, and unfortunately, not only the administration that allowed that resolution to pass in the US, but the current one uh, does come out with um, unhelpful, um, in my opinion, um, ish, uh, un unhelpful positions. Um, perhaps I can give this example. So it's not just my opinion. Uh, it's also coming from Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, the president of the Palestinian Authority. He um, famously said, with respect to the Obama administration's position on settlements, how can I be less Palestinian than the president of the United States? Now, what he meant by that is that when uh, the president of the United States was taking a position uh, and making demands uh, that he wouldn't necessarily have been making uh, even on his own behalf or on behalf of the Palestinian people, uh, he was hamstrung when it came to the negotiation table. Um, he couldn't come to negotiations asking for anything less than the United States was demanding on his behalf or uh, if further less still uh, leave that table having obtained anything less. Um, and we see this, of course, not just with respect to the United States, but the political statements by countries um, with respect to the situation, the idea that if one makes um, uh, excessive demands on Israel that will make peace easier to achieve is, is totally inverted. Uh, it actually pushes peace further away uh, because it puts unreasonable expectations on the table. Uh, and we see similar, similar issues arising all of the time with respect to Jerusalem. Um, Jerusalem is, is never going to be divided again. Um, when it was not under Israeli uh, sovereignty, Israeli control, I've already explained that the Jordanians ethnically cleansed Eastern Jerusalem uh, during their occupation of it. There has only been freedom of religion in Jerusalem under Israeli sovereignty, uh, and no responsible Israeli government is going to change that. Um, it also has to be borne in mind that the situation that arose after the withdrawal from the Gaza Strip, uh, which you know, we've just been reminded last month of over 4,300 rockets that were fired by Hamas out of that territory that Israel vacated, no responsible Israeli government can see a similar situation um, being allowed to develop uh, either in the West Bank or uh, in its capital uh, in Eastern Jerusalem. Uh, before you um, have a glass of water, you probably deserve one or a cup of tea if you want one at this point in time. Um, Judy's question, please, yes. uh, on, on, on Sheikh Jarrah um, and the discrimination point. Um, maybe you'd like to please address, address, address that, um, please. Um, well, we sort of bookend it. We, yeah. we started with that concept and it's hugely important uh, to talk about it. I have done a, a webinar with Professor Avi Bell, uh, which is on the UK uh, Lawyers for Israel Charitable Trust YouTube channel, uh, which goes into this in an awful lot more detail. But it's the response, the, res the responses, yeah, please. So the response that Judy um, t wishes to give, um, I I'll absolutely try and arm her with, uh, with, with some of the proper information on this because much of course has been made. Um, again, I would say for political purposes um, of the property dispute in, in the Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood in Eastern Jerusalem. And this is another situation, Julian, where Israel's critics have uh, distorted the facts, they've perverted uh, international law. Um, and they are also intent, uh, attempting to intimidate courts and law enforcement officials um, into adopting a bigoted approach, which is to demand that the state defy court orders 
and deny property owners their legal rights on the basis of the race of the relevant parties. Um, let's be clear that it's the people criticizing Israel that are bringing race uh, into the equation. The current um, dispute uh, in Sheikh Jarrah involves several properties uh, with tenants whose leases have expired. Uh, and in a few cases, there are squatters with no tenancy rights at all. And they are on one side of the equation against owner landlords who have successfully won court orders evicting the squatters uh, and the overstaying tenants. Now, it's important to stress that litigation over these properties has been uh, the subject of decades and it's gone all the way up to the Supreme Court. The um, owners of the property in these disputes uh, acquired their rights through an uninterrupted chain of transactions from predecessors in title in the 19th century. Now, these legal rights uh, were acquired under Ottoman law and they remain good through uh, the different uh, governmental regimes since then. So British mandate, Jordanian occupation and, and purported annexation, and then subsequently Israeli. No one seriously disputes the validity of the transactions through which the current owners acquired their rights um, from their predecessors in title. And the tenants in these disputes acquired their leasehold rights through a chain from the Jordanian custodian of enemy property in the 1950s. Now, their rights as leaseholders, not owners, were reaffirmed in several uh, Israeli court rulings, and that culminated in 1982 with the Israeli civil courts issuing uh, rulings which adopted settlement agreements between the leaseholders' um, predecessors in, in title and the owners. The only break in the owners' uninterrupted chain uh, is the seizure of these properties from 1948 to 1967, by the Jordanian custodian of enemy property. And, and this is when Jordan, uh, as I explained um, during its occupation of Eastern Jerusalem and the West Bank, uh, ethnically cleansed these areas of Jews. So the Jordanians transferred custody over all Jewish owned property to the Jordanian custodian of enemy property. However, and this is crucial, um, it never transferred title to any party and it never extinguished the owner's rights. Instead, what the custodian did was lease some of the properties uh, to Arabs who were the predecessors to the current overstaying tenants. Um, and when Israel uh, regained the territory in 1967 and Jordanian, uh, Jordan's um, occupation ended, Israel adopted legislation that vindicated the private property rights of uh, persons of all ethnicities. Israel doesn't distinguish. Israeli law doesn't distinguish on the basis of race. Um, so we had the uh, 1970 Law and Administrative Arrangements Law, uh, preserving the rights of private parties who'd received title from the Jordanian custodian of enemy property. And that was done notwithstanding um, the illegality of Jordan's occupation and the fact that those who uh, received rights from the Jordanian custodian were all Arabs, uh, since Jordanian law denied property rights to Jews. Julian, ironically, if the Jordanian custodian of enemy property had assigned title to the predecessors of the current Arab holdover tenants, um, had assigned title over the lands that it had seized from the Jewish owners, then uh, Israeli law would have respected that resulting title. So the reason the holdover tenants in Sheikh Jarrah lack ownership today is not because the state of Israel has denied uh, any rights to Palestinian Arabs, uh, but rather because the government of Jordan declined to give uh, those uh, Arab tenants title to the land. Um, so Israel's not granted anyone ownership of the affected properties. Um, Israel is not in any way a party to this case. Uh, it is a private property dispute. Um, the only intervention uh, is uh, that of the Attorney General to delay the decision. Uh, but he has subsequently indicated that he's not going to involve himself uh, in the case itself. Um, um um, what's the current current situation before we go on to the next question, please, in relation to that dispute? I think that was just in May of this year he got involved, didn't he, I think? And then it's since then what's happened to, 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 the, to the matter? Did you, do you know at all or not? So the involvement was only to delay um, delay the decision because of the situation. Um, there are many who have called that a, a form of blackmail and that the security situation uh, meant that, that the courts were not... Um, going through their proper processes, but I think there's every expectation that that decision will be handed down. 
um, when I, I'm not clear on. Um, one additional factor perhaps to just bear in mind is that there is a, a mechanism in Israeli property law, as I understand it, of um, tenants such as these being able to ask the court for discretionary relief. Now, usually that is done upon um, any rent, rent arrears being um, satisfied, but there's no requirement. Um, it is simply a case that the tenants say to the court uh, for no particular reason whatsoever, but in our circumstances, please, will you let us stay? And my understanding is that that application for discretionary relief has not been made. Uh, um, like, like, like in any functioning civil court anywhere in the world in relation to wanting relief from forfeiture, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and and you're, you're far more the expert on uh, on on property law here, uh, Julian, than I am. But um, I my understanding actually is that the the um, room for discretion available in, in Israel is is far greater, um, in fact, than under English law. I, uh, but that's I just want to I just want to take it back to the floor. Um, I think uh, Judy, would you like to ask a question at all? If you want to unmute yourself, please. I, I wanted to to raise the last part of the question, which was a key point, which is not legal position with respect to Sheikh Jarrah, but the, the Lib Dems, who we're having a big argument with at the moment, are saying that there's no equivalent law for Arabs and Palestinians. Is that true? Uh, and if it's not true, how can we show that that's not true? Um, so it, it's not that there is a, an equivalency between the laws. And um, what is um, often being referred to is, is a separate 1950 law. Um, to do with absentee property. Um, the, there are parallels in that um, there is a custodian for absentee property in the same way that there was a, a Jordanian custodian of enemy property. And the difference comes down to how those custodians have handled uh, the properties that they were entrusted with. Um, now, I've already explained that the, the Jordanian custodian of enemy property didn't transfer those property rights to anyone. So when the territory reverted back to Israel, uh, the original owner's rights had been preserved. And um, with respect to uh, the um, properties governed by the 1950 absentee law, um, the situation, of course, is, 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 it is dependent on the individual situation in each of those circumstances. Um, I, do, I do understand what you're saying. And I think probably um, a succinct response is to try and explain that uh, property rights do not give immigration rights, um, uh, because what is being argued for um, is that uh, any uh, individual property owners that left in the 1948 war, um, this is Israel's war of independence where it was uh, attacked by its neighbors, uh, and indeed um, some of the local population joined that attack as well, um, certain elements didn't, and those elements um, and their uh, descendants live as free citizens of the state of Israel, uh, as Arab Israelis, they are in fact the only Arabs in the Middle East to live in a true democracy. Um, so the question uh, attaches to, you know, what is the situation for those that left? You know, similarly, of course, um, there were 850,000 estimated Jewish refugees from Arab countries that were actually expelled um, out of their homes and found refuge in Israel. Uh, but the question is to the property rights of individuals uh, whose properties fall under the absentee law, that is yet to be determined. Um, as with uh, many other situations of conflict, a peace agreement does uh, is expected to make provision uh, for the form of compensation, if, if there is indeed to be compensation payable to any property owners who have not um, had their property restored to them. Uh, but crucially, you need to distinguish, and I think what I, I haven't come across, forgive me, the, the argument, and I've struggled to find your question in the, in the chat, I'm afraid. Um, but it, it strikes me that the argument that you are referring to is one that A, conflates property rights, immigration rights, it conflates the 1950 law and the 1970 law, um, which do not act in any way on the basis of race. Uh, but it also advocates for the Israeli legal system making distinctions in terms of the race of parties. And that is reprehensible, and that is something that needs to be pushed back on, uh, because that is the racist approach to this property dispute. Um, I'm just going to ask um, Andrew and Paula Aarons uh, to unmute themselves. Lucky you, I feel like I feel like a, a quiz show host. It's very exciting. This is very much more exciting than Wimbledon Magistrates Court. If you could unmute yourselves, please. Done. And 
and and please ask your 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 very good questions to to Natasha and for her to answer them, please, uh, if if possible. Can I? Okay, Julian, me first. Do we know why the Jordanian custodian didn't transfer title? Was there a specific reason? I mean, were they ignorant? Um, I don't I don't know that uh, there's anything being written about this. Um, I can um, assume uh, that it might have had something to do with not wanting to bestow, well, they made the, the Jordanian custodian made the decision to bestow um, leasehold rights and, and not uh, ownership. Um, the reasons behind that, I don't know. Um, but I would be far more, I mean, no one is talking about, you know, the reasons that Jordanian property law forbade Jews from owning property or, or, or any of those. I mean, the, the questions on this are, are particularly, and, and it's not yours, don't, don't get me wrong, it's, it's the, the way and the lens through which this situation is being viewed. Um, there, was, there wouldn't have been anything to stop the Jordanian custodian confiscating this property um, and uh, tearing up uh, the, uh, the Jewish ownership rights and, and bestowing those on, on the Arab individuals. I, I can't um, think there was anything that would have prevented that. I've got another question. Would you agree that as Jordan has no legal right of disposition, its assertion that it handed to Palestinian Arabs claims over Jerusalem has no basis and that therefore only Israel has grounds arising from uh, the San, uh, San Remo conference and the British mandate uh, regarding sovereignty over, um, over, over Jerusalem? Uh, Natasha, any response to that, please? Again, I think we need to be very careful here about a, stick, a distinction between property rights and, and rights of sovereignty, um, because they are different um, different things entirely. Um, I would argue that Israel's uh, sovereign claim goes back to, it's the um, Declaration of Independence, 1948. And in fact, the court in uh, Burkina Faso, Mali, and the um, International Court of Justice, when it was dealing with the principle of uti posidetis juris, referred to this moment as a, a snapshot uh, of the territory at the critical date of independence. Um, and so that's why 1948 is so crucial into uh, establishing what Israel's uh, sovereign rights were at the time. Um, the interesting thing with respect to uh, the Jordanian position um, is that Israel has respected uh, property rights created by prior regimes, um, even those that explicitly discriminated against Jews in their property laws. Um, and that's, of course, not just the Jordanians, but also the Ottoman Empire, the British Mandate um, as well. Um, and so th this is the, it's a concept in, in international law of, of sequestration and the laws that have applied elsewhere have been applied by Israel. Um, or, or the principles in adopting the position uh, that was taken by the Jordanian custodian of enemy property. Um, so Israel's recognized it uh, and uh, ab abides by the position uh, that was established by 1967. Um, so it's, it's actually not the situation that certainly Israeli law hasn't said that you know, any decisions taken by the Jordanians were totally uh, illegitimate, uh, quite the contrary. Um, you mentioned the San Remo conference. Uh, I think that is crucial in terms of the political um, and the historical context of Israel's declaration of independence. And there are many academics that argue that that has uh, significance in international law um, because of the, the commitment that was made by the international community. But I would say that really it's Israel's declaration of independence, um, we don't need special treatment for Israel. Uh, it's legitimacy uh, and its borders should be recognized in the same way that any state uh, coming into existence um, and the general principles of international law and in particular the rule of customary law uh, internet, uh, uh, should be applied equally to Israel's case as well. Now we're in um, extra time everyone we've been going for an hour um, and re you've really been put on the spot, uh, Natasha. But I would love other people, anyone else has questions for her. Let's, I mean, this is so interesting. Let's go on for a few more minutes. Everyone's happy to. Great. Um, so if, if uh, before um, I, I ask the live, any, any questions from the audience, you want to unmute yourself and ask yourself a question live at all, anyone? I said last, last um, 15 minutes, 10 minutes. Okay, I'll ask the chat question otherwise. Anyone going once, going twice? Yes, please. Oh yes, hold on. Who um who is this? Sorry. 
Mervyn Smith. Ah, Mr. Mervyn Smith, um, you are you are live. There are ten minutes to go. England two 0 down. You come on the pitch, or is it Scotland two 0 down? It's quite typical, really. Um, speak. Right. My understanding is that the Jews were granted land, including the Jordan Valley, uh, by the British Mandate in 1922. When the State of Israel was established, the UN recognized the British Mandate's uh, arrangement and under, I think it's Article 8, uh, agreed that Israel should have the rights over the Jordan Valley and parts of Judea Samaria. Um, the Jordanians then threw the Jews out uh, in, in 1948 um, and the Jews came back established settlements in 67. Why is it not left to these facts, if I'm correct, to uh, confirm that there are no grounds for the Jews to leave the areas that were acknowledged by the British Mandate and by the United Nations, leaving part of the uh, West Bank, still open for discussion between um, Israel and the Palestinians, which is, in my opinion, unlikely ever to take place. Um, so I think we need to be careful about the suggestion that anything was ever granted uh, to Israel. Um, and this is why the Declaration of Independence and, and the legal position arising out of that is so important. Uh, not least because if there's a suggestion that the international community may grant something, then um, there may also be a suggestion that they can take it away. And that it, that's just not how uh, international legal order works. Um, you're absolutely right that there are uh, provisions made for the establishment of a, of a Jewish national home uh, that the mandate was intended to facilitate. Um, and I see that similarly to the San Remo um, commitments as important uh, historical uh, also, in some respects, legal context, because uh, declarations that are made officially on behalf of states do have a, a binding effect on them. Um, but uh, we don't even need to go into all of that when we just say treat Israel as you do any other state um, and any other state as they're coming into existence. Apply customary international law equally uh, and you have your answer. And, and that is what I set out in, in some uh, detail in, in, in looking at the legal status. Um, so I think that's probably, I mean, that's the best answer um, that I, I, I think that, I, well, that I'm able to offer, but I think also crucially it's, it's the correct one. Um, it's one that isn't grappled with properly. Uh, it's one that was raised uh, with the prosecutor at the International Criminal Court um, who didn't grapple with the subject matter. Um, unfortunately, uh, she fell back on, for example, the, the principle of self-determination. Now, that's an interesting point because uh, case law on Utipos de Detis Juris has actually been very clear in indicating that this principle, which supports stability and clear lines as borders, um, should actually trump any, um, any uh, competing interests or claims of self-determination. Um, although you know, that might be very much more a controversial position to take today. Um, than uh, in the time of the Burkina Faso Mali case. Um, but I think what's crucial to, to be clear on is that uh, Israel's declaration of independence, uh, the establishment of the state predates uh, the claims of, of self-determination that, that are being made today. And those therefore have to be dealt with um, within the context of pre-existing sovereign states. Uh, the Canadian Supreme Court case of Re-Quebec uh, was very clear. Um, and actually set out in, in great detail development of the principle of self-determination and, and how it can feasibly be exercised within uh, an existing framework of, of an existing sovereign state. Um, self-determination doesn't give you a state to your, of your own uh, and in fact uh, does um, rather uh, militate towards exactly what you're describing uh, and exactly what the parties um, across the board have accepted that uh, any solution has to be negotiated. Um, the parties have to come to the table in order to do that and cannot be done 
crucially, I, I indicated the the unreasonable demands that were being made that pushed peace further away by um, significant elements of the international community. Uh, but there's also an important issue here of uh, starting on the wrong legal basis. Right? That the narrative that we are all very familiar with, which is entirely contrary uh, to what I've set out to you today, um, and incorrect, is also incredibly damaging. Uh, because it means that um, any sensible legal political negotiation isn't starting on the right foot. Um, and that's something that we all need to be prepared, I think, to grapple with very robustly um, and to push back against the misrepresentations and the abuse of international law. And as with any of um, these, these um, damaging trends, it's, it's not, it may be starting with Israel. It may be primarily targeting Israel. Um, but the impact that this abuse has is far greater than Israel. It um, undermines and uh, devalues international law across the board uh, because of the principle of its equal application. Uh, and where that is not being done, and these are political acts, political claims uh, and political calls, as opposed to legal ones, uh, that worsening of, of, of all sensible conversation and debate and discussion and productive negotiation. Um, I'm going to take uh, two more questions. I've got a glass of single malt waiting for me, which is going to take priority in a few moments time. Um, but any more questions at all from anyone? If you want to unmute yourself, please yeah, okay. do. I don't know yes. whether you can hear me. Yes, I can, sir. Yes, yes I can, Mr. Simons, um, please. Yes, I just have a, a bit of a layman's question, actually. Um, you know, whenever you turn the television on or read the newspaper and it's covering the situation between Israel and the Palestinians, the territory of the Palestinians that they, that they are on is always referred to as the occupied territories. And, you know, the term the occupied territories, to my way of thinking, always casts Israel in um, the role of the aggressor, the occupier. And I mean, whether it, it, it comes across like that to other people, I don't know, but whenever I hear them, and it's constantly bandied around that term, the occupied territories, in the connotation of the, um, you know, the, the situation there, whatever it is. And I'm wondering whether the term used by the media supposedly in an impartial way can be challenged as not being impartial. I think that's exactly what we have to do um, because not only is it not impartial, it's also fundamentally incorrect. Um, it's certainly not a, a legally correct, but it, it's also um, a misrepresentation of the, of the underlying status of the territory, of the history, uh, and promotes a narrative uh, that is incredibly damaging. Mm. Um, so, no, I, I'd absolutely agree with you. Um, and it sounds legalistic, doesn't it? Um, mm. It comes with um, perhaps the, the additional legitimacy um, of, of law, but it is part and parcel, and I mentioned some of these um, terms earlier on, uh, of a big push in academia uh, to delegitimize Israel with um, painting it as a, as a colonial entity, um, a colonial occupier. Um, the, the notion that the Jews who have um, been colonized uh, throughout history can now be painted uh, as colonizers is, um, mm. is, is utterly ludicrous um, and totally at odds. Mm. I should say, Mr. Simons, that if you um, complain to the BBC and your complaint is upheld by the BBC editorial department, I will buy you a bottle of single malt whiskey. In fact, I'll buy you three bottles of single malt whiskey. Such will be the chance of that. And yes. if you manage to get a copy of the Balin report that was withheld by the BBC, I think 14, 15 years ago, I'll give you a crate of single malt whiskey and my children and my house as well. Um, as you know, there was a report written some years ago um, by the BBC, but there's no offer, consideration, offer and acceptance, and there's no intention to create legal relations in that comment by me. Well, I should say, Julian, we are on the case and have been asking for some time now, but also in, increasingly with the recent controversies surrounding the BBC for the publication of that report. Um, the suggestion is that, that there is some damning material if it would have been um, buried uh, for such a long time. Uh, but even 
leaving that report aside, I think it's crucially important that we have opportunities like this to push back on these terms. Do you um, think, do you think, just before we go on to one or two more questions, do you think 16 years on or 15 years on the bailing report, if an FOI request is made now, there will be more chance because it's historic only of getting the, the, the report in litigation or, or not uh, in relation to that, that, that report? That's the... So that's there are, the um, as, as far as I'm aware, there are ongoing FOI requests um, and they have not yet been successful, but who knows? The, the difficulty and the hurdle, unfortunately, is only becoming greater um, as reporting on this develops, um, is that um, these terms are becoming accepted. Um, and part of that, I indicated, is, is because of their, uh, the agenda that is being promoted through academia. But an awful lot of that is also arising from um, NGOs, uh, so-called civil society, uh, organisations with substantial amounts of funding that have been set up uh, principally for the purpose of driving an anti-Israel agenda. Reports, uh, well, we've even seen a, a recent report that did make substantial headlines um, from uh, Human Rights uh, Watch calling Israel out as, as an apartheid state, um, which is ludicrous to anyone who's actually been there and witnessed or knows Israeli Arabs um, and the full part that they take in society in Israel. Also embraced by the government, um, and so the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office uses that terminology. So, um, j j j just in relation to the BBC, we're going to go on to a couple of questions. I think it's also very important. It's not just the media reports; it's their website too. What is on their website in particular for kids? They will research online. It becomes gospel. Excuse the word in this context. So it's very important that those untruths are taken out. Um, there's a very interesting comment from uh, from Morris saying uh, there have been 400 FOI requests to release the Balin report and each one has been uh, unsuccessful. Um, well, let's hope there's a 400 and first one that's successful. I should say though, with respect to the BBC and its educational um, output, BBC Bite Size had tremendously troubling material videos on uh, the Middle East conflict um, and with very careful painstaking work by UK lawyers for Israel, um, those, uh, those have been removed. Um, the hope is that something more balanced can be um, put out and something more accurate uh, rather than the false misrepresentations. I think, I think 15 years on from the Bailing Report, that is now the, the, the biggest battle. It's not a report by Jeremy Bowen. It's not a report or, 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 or from someone on the scene in, 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 in Israel. It is the website. Material on the website, it stays there. Kids look at it. Kids use it as Reese for Research 101 on, 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 the, um, on the conflict. Um, can I... Uh, do we as Jews subject to so much oppression and eviction over centuries uh, not view it as our humanitarian duty to ensure that Palestinians enjoy safety and 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 and, and security? Um, and then Natasha, what would you say about about that? Oh, I'd absolutely mm. agree, um, and I, I think Israel takes that duty far more seriously than, unfortunately, the international community, um, and desperately, unfortunately, the Palestinian leadership. Um, Israel has consistently done more, and I don't just mean for uh, Israeli Arabs, those who are citizens of Israel, um, but if you poll uh, Palestinians living, and people, people have polled Palestinians living in, in the West Bank, and, and they are able to answer honestly, consistently they say they would, um, in any scenario, prefer to be um, citizens of Israel than citizens of any future Palestinian state because of the way that they have been treated by their own leadership, uh, by the rest of the Arab world and by, unfortunately, the international community. I mean, the continued support for UNRWA perpetuating a, a refugee status across generations, which is unique to the Palestinians, it doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, that level of abuse uh, and oppression uh, that the Palestinians have been suffering, and I stress not by Israel, um, is shocking. And it's not reported on. Uh, when I've spoken at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, one of my speeches was dedicated to the treatment of Palestinians by the Palestinian leadership uh, and many surrounding Arab states. Uh, and we do need to be raising our voices and, and addressing that situation. Um, and I see that as an element of, um, you know, humanity as opposed to strictly uh, rooted in, in Jewish tradition, but uh, Jewish teaching can only um, heighten uh, the importance of, of doing that. Uh, but that does not mean that we can uh, be hesitant in pushing back against the misrepresentations 
and the blood libels, because of course this is the modern form of the blood libel, the accusations have been made against Israel that have no basis in reality. Uh, in the Middle Ages, anti-Semitism manifested itself in the, the myth that uh, Jews killed Christian children to use their blood to make matzah. Uh, that developed through uh, post the Enlightenment period um, when uh, anti-Semitism had more of a scientific basis, or I should say a pseudo-scientific basis, where eugenics was used to justify Jew hate against the race. Well, today, and of course, uh, Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs has, has made this point m uh, many, many times um, uh, before his passing, uh, and far more eloquently than I, I'm able to myself. But his uh, analysis indicated that the modern form of anti-Semitism presented itself against the Jewish state, uh, and this was the modern form of the blood libel to call Israel an oppressive colonial apartheid uh, ethnic cleansing regime where none of those things are true. Uh, because it is the language of human rights uh, and international law that are the modern order of the day in the way that science uh, was previously and religion was previous to that. Uh, and that's something that we need to do in, con in combination, uh, you know, fight for Palestinian rights and, and fight against uh, the blood libels against the state of Israel. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Natasha. That was a real um, tour de force. I see people are trying to clap on their screens at the moment. That was a real tour de force. It's been a total privilege for uh, Wimbledon. You can see in South London, we don't bite, uh, but for you to uh, come and give this talk to us, um, you know, you, you were a real fighter on television. I know that for um, Israel and for Israel advocacy during the recent uh, conflict. Um, in, in Gaza, I know you were on Sky News, I saw you on, you are on other, other TV channels, in the radio as well, and as an eloquent and articulate person such as yourself advocating for Israel in this country it makes such a huge difference. And you're also very brave doing it. I can't imagine the type of vitriol and abuse you've got from it as, as, as well. Uh, and huge kol hakavod and huge respect to you for doing this. And I think it's a real privilege that you've um, been able to give us this talk and show us your knowledge and learning on the um, on the on 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 the on, on the um, on the on, on the subject. As I've got a single malt waiting for me at this point in time, and I hope you've got a a, a large glass of of wine for your for your for yourself. As I said, South London doesn't bite. But unless I allow Judy Wellerminsky to give the vote of thanks, she may well bite. So I'm going to uh, 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 put us over to her now. And again, thank you uh, so much. Thank you so much. Well, it's very difficult to follow and give a vote of thanks when I've had it given so effectively by Judy. And <laughs> I echo everything that he said. And I hope I've got this correct. But the big message I take away from your talk is that we need to focus much more on the Declaration of Independence and how foundational that is in the right of Israel, not only to exist, but also in its status in Judea and Samaria uh, and all that follows from that. And we need to not let people divert us from that foundational point. That's a big message I got. Did I get that right? Absolutely. That, that's the critical date. Um, and that uh, really puts the lie to the arguments in international law that are being circulated so frequently on Israel. Um, so if, if anyone here feels better able to contend with, with those issues and that subject matter, then um, I'm tremendously grateful for the time that you've given this evening and, and for your questions and, and Judy for organising and hosting. Well, thank you for that. And it wasn't just me, but we, we all thought you were absolutely fantastic. Uh, can I just take a moment to advertise the next South London Israel Forum event, which is on the 8th of July, when it will be a talk by Nora Salik, and many of you will have heard Nora talked before, who always gives a fascinating uh, aspect to everything. Um, and he will be talking on Israel and Gaza, what you always wanted to know but never dared to ask. Uh, and so can, can, can I also add, um, if any of you want to, please do join UK Lawyers for Israel, which Detach the director of. If you are a lawyer out there, or a law student or know a law student or lawyers, please do get them to join uh, UK Lawyers uh, for Israel. Uh, and of course, on a practical level, uh, to join the uh, Zionist Federation um, as, as well. But certainly if you're a lawyer, please join UK LFI. It's a great organization, does huge amounts of work behind the radar for the last um, eight, nine years, 10 years now. I was a director for some years, not anymore. Um, my footsteps have been taken by someone 
brilliant, which is good news. Um, and thank you so much. Um, any more announcements, Michael at all? Anything to I'll say? Over to Michael for him to make his contribution. Um, well, the thing I'll be taking away, Natasha, is the YouTube recording, so I can listen to it all again because there was so much information that you gave us there in an hour. Um, certainly for a non-lawyer such as myself, I will need to listen to it again slowly in order to be able to take it all in.